smartest people, the biggest ideas. Most of the scientists, uh, but also many economists now, are saying that climate change could end up costing us more than two world wars and the depression combined. And at the heart of the problem is the oil that drives our society and the carbon pollution that that gives off. We desperately need this oil. We're afraid that it's running out and still it's killing us. So there are a few people around who can do a better job at explaining our situation, our dilemma, offering up some of the choices we face and looking forward to the days ahead. Andrew, Andrew Nikiforic. I have a story for you today, and it's a story about a nation that doesn't realize a nation-changing event is taking place in northern Alberta. And it is an event that if it unfolds, as people predict it will unfold, will turn us into a tar nation. And you're thinking, okay, how can we be a tar nation? Well, a tar nation begins this way, and it begins with the first law of petropolitics. In the first law, uh, I came across just last year uh, in a magazine called Foreign Policy and in an article written by Thomas Friedman, uh, the brilliant columnist for the New York Times. And in this article, Thomas Friedman laid out a very simple law. He said, as the price of oil goes up, democracy goes down. And he looked at a number of countries and he looked at Nigeria and Venezuela and Russia and he said, you know, when, when oil was 20 bucks a barrel, those countries all seemed to have some democratic reform movements. But as soon as oil reached 50, 60, 70 dollars a barrel, those democratic reform movements disappeared. And he said, what is it about oil that makes nation states petro tyrants? And it came back to one simple principle. That if a nation state is making the majority of its income from oil, it no longer has to tax its people. And if it's not taxing its people, then it no longer has to represent them. There's an old American saying, and I was raised in the United States, that no taxation without representation. And a petrol state reverses that. There is no representation without taxation. Now the idea that I want to leave with you today and that's very much part of this story about a nation becoming a tar nation, is will the law of petropolitics change Canada? Now, I come from a province called Alberta, a very extraordinary place, and I thought, okay, well, this is very interesting what Friedman has to say. Does this apply to Alberta? And we always think of Albertans as being these mavericks. And then I thought, well, wait a moment. Now, we've had a one-party rule in Alberta for 36 years. Isn't that extraordinary? Isn't that something you would expect in a petro state? Where every time the government makes a mistake, it can placate the people with petrodollars. Why will we become a tar nation? Well, here's the tar. It's called bitumen. And actually what it really is, is bitumen or tar, water, clay, and sand, lots of sand. The Cree used to use this to caulk their canoes and repair their canoes. We are now using this to fuel the nation. 50% of Canada's oil supply now comes from the tar sands. 16% of America's oil now comes from the tar sands. Now, a lot of people say, well, isn't this oil? <laughs> Shouldn't we call this the oil sands? Calling this oil is like calling a dogfish tuna. And it is a marketing ploy that makes it seem very convenient. Make no mistake about it, this is the bottom of the barrel stuff. This is the world's dirtiest fuel. Now where do we find it? Well, we find it in northern Alberta in three different locations. The Athabasca deposit is the largest. Um, we find it in Peace River country. We also find it in Cold Lake. Now, if you were to take all these deposits and add them up, they are equal to one quarter of Alberta. 
Another way to imagine that is to think of the state of Florida or the state of New York. And what we are about to do, we are about to industrialize a landscape the size of Florida or of New York in northern Canada. And we are doing it in one of the continent's largest watershed, the Mackenzie River Basin. There are only two other watersheds in the world that are as large as the Mackenzie, or larger, and that is the Amazon and the Mississippi River Basin. There are 360,000 people, First Nations, that depend on the water in the Mackenzie River Basin. And the tar sands are located right on the Athabasca River. Now, this is what we are doing. This is open pit mining. Um, in the United States, they would say, my god, doesn't that look like Appalachia? And it does. But we wouldn't say that here in Canada. The little circle, that's a truck. Some of these open pit mines occupy 150 square miles of forest. Here's a little bit of engineering pornography. My truck is bigger than your truck. This is a 400 ton truck, the largest truck in the world. The tires alone cost $50,000 a year to replace. Uh, when fully loaded, uh, this truck weighs more than two 747s. Every day, we are removing enough forest and sand from northern Alberta to fill Yankee Stadium. Jeff Rubin, the chief economist at the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, I think made a good point. He said, Andrew, when you have to move two tons of sand to make one barrel of oil, actually, no, you put it this way, Andrew, when you have to schlep two tons of sand to make one barrel of oil, you know you are at the bottom of the ninth inning. To make one barrel of oil, we have to make two and a half barrels of toxic crud. There are two ways to produce this tar. One are the open pit mines. That's the high grade stuff. It's very shallow. It's on the surface just below the trees. The stuff that's much further down in the ground requires something called in situ operations. And what you do here is you take some water and you heat it up and you make it into steam and you take the steam and you pump it down into the ground into great, great depths and there the steam will melt the tar and then you will have another collection point where you will suck up uh, the tar and then it will on, pull it up and then you will refine it. Now the in situ operations are not as ugly as the open pit ones, but imagine a forest industrialized and fragmented on this scale. The in situ operations are about 80% of the tar sands. And we are looking at industrializing a landscape the size of Vancouver Island like that. This is the Athabasca River. This is where we get the water to make the oil. This river is about 15 kilometers long. Um, it is a beautiful river, a beautiful northern river that feeds into Lake Athabasca and then eventually feeds into the Mackenzie and into the Arctic. So how much water are we taking out of this river? Well, it takes three barrels of potable fresh water to make one barrel of oil. This is why this is dirty oil. So how much is that? Every year, well, it's 350 million cubic meters. And I can't get my head around that. I don't know what that means. What it does mean, another way to, to, to visualize it, is 400,000 Olympic-sized pools. Every year, we are pulling out of the Athabasca River 400,000 Olympic-sized pools. That's the same amount of water that the city of Calgary consumes, or that two cities of Calgary consume. And soon, we will be pulling enough water out of the Athabasca River to sustain the entire population of metropolitan Toronto by 2015. But it, it's kind of a misnomer to talk about, well, we're taking this water out, but we're not returning it. 90% of the water ends up in toxic tailing ponds like this. 
There are nearly 10 or a dozen of these tailings ponds all along the Athabasca River. Some of them are larger than lakes in Muskoka. Some of them are 20 kilometers long. The world's largest dam is the Sincrude Tailings Pond with 540 million cubic meters of toxic waste. When the Three Gorges Dam is completed, the Sincrude Tailings Dam will become the world's second largest dam. So it takes about, to make one barrel of oil, we have to make two and a half barrels of toxic crud, polycyclic aero hydro, uh, uh, hydrocarbons, naphthanic acids, heavy metals, arsenic, all kinds of salts. They end up in these ponds. And the scarecrow is to warn uh, migratory birds that it's not a good idea to land on this body of water. Uh, when they do, uh, they get coated in oil and they sink to the bottom. Now you'll notice that at the bottom of this slide, the forest has been completely cleared away. And it will soon become an open pit mine. These dikes rise about 100 meters. And I recently asked a guy, uh, Norbert Morgenstern, geotechnical engineer. And I said, Norbert, you help build many of these dams. Are any of them leaking? And he said, yes, Andrew. The, there is one that we know about, in, at the Tar Island Dike. And it is leaking, and it has been leaking into the Athabasca River for more than 30 years. Um, these dikes are so large and so that, that they're leaking all along their bases, and they create toxic marshes. There's a community downstream from Fort McMurray called Fort Chip. And for the last 10 years, people here have noticed um, a rising incidence of bile duct cancer, brain cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer. Um, and other diseases. And there's an Irish doctor by the name of Dr. John O'Connor who goes up to the community every week and he said, um, this, is, this is strange, I'm not seeing this in Fort McMurray among my patients, I'm not seeing this number of cancers. Is there a connection here? Is there something I should be concerned about? And that was the question that he asked his, uh, the government of Alberta and the government of Canada. And the response he got was this. A complaint was lodged against him before the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Alberta, and the complaint was basically from Health Canada, Alberta Health, and from Environment Canada, was that Dr. John O'Connor was causing undue agitation among the people of Fort Chip. And he is under investigation for asking a question. This is an upgrader. Of course, when it, it takes a lot of energy to produce bitumen. And because it is such a low quality uh, um, hydrocarbon, um, very heavy and full of sulfur, it has to be upgraded before it can, can be used as a thin, synthetic fuel. Because it requires so much energy, for every barrel of oil that we produce up there, we burn as much natural gas as four houses use in a day. So how much natural gas is that over the course of a day? Every day we use enough natural gas in the tar sands to heat four million homes. Soon we'll be using enough natural gas up there to heat eight million homes or nearly 15% of the natural gas supply of Canada. A lot of people in the natural gas industry say, this is like turning gold into lead. When you have to use that much natural gas to produce the world's dirtiest oil, then you want to drill landscapes like this. This is in the eastern slopes of the Rockies, and there's plans to put 10,000 natural gas wells in this, in, 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 in this area. And they want to turn it into a landscape that looks like this. This is the Jonah Field, a tight gas play in Wyoming, where eventually you will have five-acre spacings between the wells. And there are no antelope here anymore. There are no uh, sage um, grouse. And the ranchers call this a sacrifice zone. And when you have that much natural gas drilling taking place across the landscape, you end up with uh, parlor tricks that you can do like this. This is a pop bottle. This pop bottle was filled with tap water from Rosebud, Alberta. And five minutes later, uh, Jessica Ernst could take the cap off the bottle and set it aflame. In Alberta, an advantage. So here's methane gas leaking from natural gas wells into groundwater. We are now producing a million barrels of oil a day in the tar sands. 
That is like going to Los Angeles and finding a parking lot with 12 million cars all idling every day. Climate change, carbon. How much carbon are we making up there? And we always talk in terms of megatons and millions of tons. And again, I cannot imagine that. So imagine this. We are now producing a million barrels of oil a day in the tar sands. That is like going to Los Angeles and finding a parking lot with 12 million cars all idling every day. The tar sands are now the world's largest energy project. They are the world's largest capital project. They are the world's largest engineering project. Stephen Harper has talked about Canada becoming a, you know, a major energy superpower. Orrin Hatch, the Republican uh, senator from Utah, calls the tar sands the 800-pound gorilla of world oil markets. And we know that that's an insult to gorillas. Dick Cheney talks about it as being the key to North America's energy security and prosperity. Executives in the oil sands call this the anchor of prosperity. Watch how it will change the continent in the next 10 to 15 years as the tar sands becomes the center of North America's energy corridor. One act of destruction leads to another act of destruction. So what does this mean then in personal terms? Well, 50% of our oil for Canada now comes from the tar sands. And, and so that's most of Canada, including Ontario, with the exception of Quebec and Atlantic Canada. They're getting their oil from Venezuela and Nigeria. And interestingly enough, their oil imports have increased by 300% at the same time that we have doubled production in the tar sands. So most of this oil is going to the United States. So when we fill up, this is what we are doing. Every year, the average Canadian consumes 25 barrels of oil. Family of four is obviously consuming 100 barrels of oil. These averages, of course, are much greater in Alberta. It's 75 barrels of fresh water that we are consuming every year. And this water is coming out of the Athabasca River. We are producing, then, 62.5 barrels of toxic waste every year. We are using enough natural gas to eat 400 homes when we purchase our 25 barrels of oil a year. We are moving 50 tons of earth in the forest. Let me, for a moment, just tell you a bit about Fort McMurray. We've talked about water. We've talked about carbon. We've talked about energy. What about the people? Fort McMurray, as a result of this tar sands boom, used to have a population of 36,000. It now has a population of 80,000 people. It has had a population growth rate of 9% since 1996. Chinese-scale population growth. Um, there are so many people now crowded into Fort McMurray that there are people who rent out garages, that there are people who live in their trucks, that there are nine people who will, who will share, share an apartment. The medical services have become so critically poor and insufficient that you can go to Mongolia and find more physicians per capita than you can in the Northern Lights region in Northern Alberta. The drug addiction rates are among the highest in all of Canada. You now have 30,000 single guys, mostly, working in camps throughout the tar sands region. And they come from Atlantic Canada, and they come from Hungary, and they come from China, and they come from all over the world. The highway to Fort McMurray is called Hell's Highway. And it is called Hell's Highway because the average speed on the highway is 178 kilometers per hour. And it is full of single men who, as soon as they get off shift, they get into their GMC 4x4, and they head to Edmonton for some R&R. &R. And a lot of them don't make it. An average of five men a year, five men a month, die on Hell's Highway. Fort McMurray is a remarkable place. I mean, it, it's the kind of place that, that the average income there is $90,000 a year. But not everyone makes $90,000 a year. So I asked an American, Matt Simons, I said, Matt, what do we do? And Matt Simons is a Houston investment banker and a peak oil analyst, um, very highly respected guy across the world. And Matt said, you know, this is the first thing I would do. First of all, I'd make it illegal to use potable water to make oil. He said, you Canadians are crazy to do that. Then I would cap production. 
If you ever, if we're now at one million barrels a day. If we get up to three million barrels a day, Matt Simons thinks we'll destroy Alberta, and he might well be right. So power down, cap production, protect water. So every time you go up and fill up, this is what you must think of, that you are contributing to the destruction of the boreal forest, that you are making toxic ponds of waste, that you are draining a river, that you are unwittingly supporting deeper integration with the United States by building this energy corridor. And I would argue that you are also unwittingly, unknowingly, making the first law of petropolitics a reality in Canada. A nation cannot have health, a nation cannot have wellness, a nation cannot have neighborliness, a nation cannot have empathy, cannot have fairness, if it is a nation built on an earth-destroying economy. Thank you. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.